Well, as we come now to worship the Lord, let's sing praise to his name. We come to sing praise to the great king. That's the main emphasis in the Psalms I have chosen today. And Psalm 145b stands as 1 to 3, certainly emphasizes praising the great king. That's really how it begins, isn't it? My God, O king, in praise I will exalt you. My God, O king, in praise I will exalt you. And I will bless your name forevermore. Great commitment here to blessing and praising the name of the great king. In fact, he says, yes, every day, time and again, I bless you and praise your name both now and evermore. We come to worship a great king who is worthy of our praise each and every day, who is worthy of being praised forevermore. Psalm 145b then, the first three stanzas, uh, the tune is O Store Good, number 289. If you're able to stand, please stand as we sing praise, and then remain standing for us to join together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we return thanks to you for this beautiful and bright morning that you have granted to us. We thank you for the beginning of a new season of the year. For we acknowledge, O Lord, that you are the one who has established the seasons. And each in their turn come as you appoint them. And we do thank you for this bright and even warm beginning to the autumn season of the year. A season with its own beauty and its own splendour. For you are the magnificent creator God, and you've created everything beautiful in its own time. And we come especially today, Lord, as we've just been singing, to praise you as the king. 
to sing praises to you as the king over all the earth. We praise you that you are a great king. Lord, we can't even imagine the full extent of your power and of your majesty. But help us, O oh Lord, to come this morning with some sense of your awesomeness and your splendor and your glory and so worship you with humility and with reverence. We praise you that you are the, the good king, good to us in so many ways. And we thank you for every token of your goodness that we've received from your hands even during this week that has just passed. We praise you, Lord, that you're also the gracious and the loving king. And especially we praise you that you so love the world, that you sent your one and only son into the world, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. We praise you for the supreme demonstration of your love at the cross of Jesus Christ, where he died for sinners such as we are. So help us, O Lord, to worship our Lord and King with joy and thanksgiving and delight as well this day. And Lord, we praise you that you are the righteous King, that you always act in line with your character, that you never treat anyone unfairly, but you always act justly. And we thank you that one day the great King, our Lord Jesus Christ, will return to this earth and he will judge the living and the dead and he will judge all with equity. And we praise you especially too, Lord, that you are a King who is mighty to save. And we praise you for Jesus, our mighty Saviour. And as the Gospel, the Good News, is proclaimed in many different places today, we pray, O gracious God, that by your mighty power you will save many lost sinners and bring them into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Lord, thank you for everyone you've gathered into this building today. We pray you'll unite our hearts together to praise and to exalt your name as our good, our gracious, our loving and our righteous King. In Jesus' name we pray, also asking forgiveness in his name for our many sins. Amen. Well, our first reading in the scriptures today is from Psalm number 47. Psalm number 47. We'll be singing from this psalm at the end of our worship service, and I'll be expounding it as well in the course of the sermon. I want to read it now. And as you'll see, the theme is God is king over all the earth. God is king over all the earth. Psalm number 47. Let's hear the word of God. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a, a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is King of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. So reads the word of God. Ask the children, please, the boys and girls, if you'll come forward. Uh, to the front. Who this is 
I'm sure all the big people will recognise as well who this is. I'd be very surprised if you don't know who this is. <laughs> you recognise him? He's a king, isn't he? You can tell he's a king because he's got the, the crown on, he's got the scepter, and he's got what's called the, the orb in his hand as well, and he's got very, very fancy robes, hasn't he? And there's another reason why you know he's the king as well. Where is he sitting? And that's on the throne, a very fancy chair called the throne. So you can tell he's the king because he's got a crown on his head, he has these in his hands, he's got a fancy robe, and he's sitting on a chair. And who is this king, and where does he rule over? He's the king of where? Yeah. That's his name, King Charles. King Charles the Third. So there's King Charles the First, King Charles the Second, and now King Charles the Third. And where does he rule over? Where does King Charles III rule over? Does he rule over Pakistan? Does he rule over Italy? Does he rule over Portugal? Where does he rule over? The United Kingdom, yes. And he's sort of the head over some Commonwealth countries as well. But in particular, he's king of the United Kingdom. So is he king over all the earth? No, he's not king over all the earth. Now, it used to be the British Empire was so large it covered large parts of the earth and queen victoria have you heard of her when she reigned she ruled over many nations but she didn't rule over all the earth there were still lands that she didn't rule over so king charles is the king of our nation and we should honor him and respect him as such he's the king of our nation but he's not the king over all the earth who is the king over all the earth do you think who's the king over all the earth Exactly, or the Lord Jesus, God, and here it says it here uh, in the psalm we just read and we'll be singing. God is king over all the earth. God's king over all the earth. And why? What should we do then? How should we? How should we honor this king who's the king over all the earth? Whenever King Charles appears, what do people often do? What do they often do whenever he appears to honor him? They do something. They they, they sing something, don't they? What do they sing? They sing the... Uh, well, they, they sung psalms at his coronation, but normally if, if King Charles is visiting somewhere on a special occasion, they often sing what's, what's it called? The National Anthem. God save the, the King. And that's to honour the King. That's to say, we honour you, O King. And to pray for God's blessing on him. So... God is king over all the earth. How should we honour him? Well, here's what it says. God is king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. So how are we to honour the king who's the one who's king over all the earth? Whenever we sing praises. And I want to encourage you, boys and girls, I want to encourage us all. Let's always be king. Let's always be king to sing praises to the Lord God. For that's honouring him. And later on in the psalm, it says over and over again, sing praises, sing praises, sing praises. So in church, in church, maybe you don't think you're a good singer, do your very best to sing praises in worship to the great king. And in your home as well. In times when you're gathering around the kitchen table and after a meal, it's good to sing a psalm and to sing praises to the one who is king of all the earth. So just as King Charles sometimes has sung to him the national anthem, even more so, we should sing praises to the one who is the king, the mighty king over all the earth and who deserves to be praised everywhere, not just in Gerbuk, but everywhere, for he is the king of all the earth. And there we are. God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. And maybe even when you're a bit bigger, if you're a good singer, you know what you could do? You might become one of the presenters. We're very thankful for the ones who are presenting, leading the psalms, the singing of praise. Maybe when you're bigger, if you have a good singing voice, you could become one of the presenters in this congregation. And that would be a very good thing to be able to do. There we are. Go back to your seats now.
We're going to sing praise now again to our King and using the words of Psalm number 72. Psalm number 72. The first six stanzas, the tune is Evangel number 181. Evangel 181. Three things about this king to whom we're going to sing praise. First of all, he is the righteous king. He will rule over the people righteously. And especially he will not exploit or take advantage of the poor, unlike many earthly rulers. This king, this perfect king, King Jesus, will rule righteously and fairly. And secondly, he's going to rule for how long? Well, really, forever, it says. His rule is a a, a lasting one. Look at stanza four. Let them, while sun and moon will last, fear you through ages all. Stanza five. May just men flourish in his days. May there be through peace, which will abound through ages all, until the moon will cease. And how far will he rule? Well, it says in stanza six, from sea to sea may he rule. And from the river to earth's end, from the river Euphrates to the very ends of the earth. And we know we come to worship a Lord today who is King of kings and Lord of lords, whose rule is over all the earth. Let us come to sing praise then to him. Psalm 72, stanzas 1 to 6, the tune is Evangel. We stand again to praise the Lord. see it. Well, let's continue on in our worship of our Lord as we bring forward the morning tithes and offerings.
Let's sing praise once more. Uh, and we use this time the words of Psalm 113, the B version, all. Uh, the tune is Hendon, number 234. Speaking of a great king who rules over all the nations, stands the two. From the dawn to setting sun, praise the Lord, the mighty one. O'er all nations he is high, yea, his glory crowns the sky. And yet this great and mighty king is the one who condescends to reach down, to reach down to help those who need to be rescued and, and saved. Stands the three. Who is like the Lord our God? High in heaven is his abode, who himself doth humble though things in heaven and earth to know. And don't we see that so, so clearly in the incarnation, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, not in a royal palace, but in a manger in a stable, one who didn't wear royal robes, but who was truly the king who came to save and to establish his kingdom. Psalm 113b then, the tune Hendon. If you're able to stand, please stand, sing praise, and then we'll again remain standing for prayer. Let us pray together. <coughs> Gracious Lord, we thank you that you are the king over all the earth and you rule over every nation of the world. And we acknowledge, O oh Lord, that you're the king over everything that happens. You're sovereign over everything that happens. And so, Lord, we want to commit unto you the plans and purposes and meetings uh, that are planned to be held over these coming days and to ask your blessing upon them. Lord, we pray for the communion time that we're looking forward to celebrating together as a body of your people. We pray that during this communion time it may be used to draw each one of us closer to Jesus as we proclaim his death until he comes. 
Now we do look to you that you'll bless the preaching of your word during the communion time. That as your word is preached, uh, the truths, the precious truths about our Saviour may be brought home afresh to each one of our hearts and we may rejoice afresh in him. And Lord, as the symbols of the Lord's Supper, as the elements are, 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 are distributed, may that powerful symbolism uh, help us to rejoice in Jesus as the one whose body was broken uh, for us and the one whose precious blood was shed in order to cover over the sins of his people. So Lord, we do ask for you to please bless us and help us to honour you during the communion time. Lord, we also ask your blessing upon the planned installation of your servant David Fallows to the Ballylagan congregation later on this week. We ask, O Lord, that you will greatly bless the ministry there. We pray that you'll greatly use your servant David Fallows in the years that lie ahead to build up your people in Ballylagan in their faith. And also, Lord, that he may be able to lead and inspire the congregation there to be effective witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ the community round about that church building. Lord, we also commit to you and ask for your blessing upon the uh, Presbury meeting to be held in Balamone on Wednesday evening. Be with all of us who are elders there, both ruling and teaching elders, and help us to be eager uh, to, to oversee well the flocks which you have entrusted to our care. And Lord, looking further ahead, we ask for your blessing upon the various uh, meetings and ministries that will resume in this congregation of your people in the month of September. Lord, bless the ministry to the youth. Lord, we know that you are the, the shepherd who has a particular concern for the lambs of the flock. And so as a, the ministry to the youth uh, resumes in various forms over this autumn season, O oh Lord, we pray it will be a source of rich spiritual blessing to the hearts of the young people. And Lord, too, we ask for your blessing upon the ministry of the Friendship Group as its ministry resumes later on this month as well. We pray, Lord, that again, warm, good fellowship will be enjoyed and spiritual blessing will be poured out upon all those who come along to the Friendship Group. We ask indeed, O oh Lord, you'll bring along new people to benefit from uh, the fellowship there. And now, gracious Lord, as we come again to hear your word being, being read and being proclaimed, Speak to us, speak to us by your Holy Spirit and do us good. In Jesus' name we pray all these things and all for his glory. Amen. Before we turn back to Psalm 47, uh, let's read another portion in the word of God uh, which emphasizes the, the lordship and the kingship uh, of our, of our Saviour. Uh, turning to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. God has been very, very gracious to us as he was to the, the church in John's day to give us such a, a vision into heaven and of what is happening in heaven. And here there's a vision of a, a heavenly throne and here we, we see the one who is on that throne being worshipped and praised as being holy and almighty and eternal. So let's read this passage, this vision of the throne in heaven. Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit. And behold a throne stood in heaven. With one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow. That had the appearance of a, an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders. Clothed in white garments with golden crowns on, on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there were, as it were, as there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, 
are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion. The second living creature like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around within and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their, their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. May God bless this, the reading of his word to our hearts this day. Please turn back with me now to Psalm number 47. This is the last of the Psalms we'll be expounding as the, the summer season is over. Lord willing, shortly after return, after the holiday, I, I will hope to be going back to expounding the book of Romans. It's Psalm number 47. I want to begin by asking you a very simple question this morning, just get you to think. Here's a list of an order of service, a proposed order of service. What's missing from this list? Listen to what I read. See if you can spot what is missing from this order of worship service. Prayer, Bible reading, children's talk, offering, scripture reading, sermon, benediction. Prayer, Bible reading, children's talk, offering, scripture reading, sermon and benediction. What's missing from that that ought to be part of every worship service? Well, I'm sure you've spotted what's missing. It is, of course, the singing of praise. The singing of praise. And I ask you that question just to highlight the fact the singing of praise is an essential aspect of any worship service. The singing of praise is one of the main ways in which we, as the people of God, are to honour and glorify the Lord our God. Those who have no Christian faith, those who have no commitment to God, they're not interested in singing praise, are they? They will sing songs about many things, love songs, patriotic songs, but they'll have no interest whatsoever in singing praise to God. Whereas you and I, whenever we come together in worship, we should delight, we should delight to sing praise to him. And the psalm here this morning, Psalm 47, that should certainly bring this home to us. For this is a psalm that is actually filled with praise from beginning to end. And especially, have a look for a moment at verse 6. Verse 6. What do you notice about verse 6? It's full of praise from beginning to end, isn't it? Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our, our King Sing praises four times over. Four times over. We're exhorted to sing praises. <coughs> and uh, it's singing praises especially to the one who is the king over all the earth. Isn't that right? Note the, the link word in verse 7. For God is king of all the earth or over all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. A reminder to us today that the Lord has not just been praised here, singing praise here in, uh, in, in Derbuk. <laughs> Did it again, didn't I? I hadn't done that for a long time. <laughs> he's not just been sung praise to here in Derbuk, but he's been, been sung praise to all over the world, throughout the earth today, in many different languages, by many different tribes and peoples. Praise, will, here you see this vision of the psalm. Praise wasn't to be confined to Jerusalem 
or merely to the limits of the nation of Israel. The psalm has a worldwide vision. The king of all the earth is to be praised throughout the earth. And so the title of the, of the sermon is exactly the title that the, 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 the uh, translation here gives to it. The title of the sermon is Sing Praise to God who is king over all the earth. Let's be sure we keep singing praise to the one who is king over all the earth. I want to divide the psalm into four simple parts. First of all, verse 1. And it is, if you like, an opening call to praise or an introductory call to praise. It sets the tone. And it's a call to praise. And who's it addressed to? It's addressed to all peoples. All peoples. The God of Israel was never regarded, you see, as a mere national deity, but as the one worthy of universal allegiance and devotion. And here from even this first verse, we can identify two aspects of this praise. First of all, it's not to be a silent form of praise. It's not to be a silent form of devotion. Far from it. Look at the call to clap your hands and the call to shout to God with loud songs. There's no endorsement given here for the practice of some monks who spend all of their time in silent devotion. Some orders of monks in the medieval period and some still today even, they spend all their time in silence. Now there are times of course when it's good to be silent. When it's good to engage in silent meditation in the presence of our awesome God. You do come across examples in the Bible of calls to silence. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 20 for instance. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. No words are suitable in this instance. And you see, it can be the case. There could be a lot of noise, a lot of excitement, but not much genuine appreciation of the Lord whom we're supposed to be adoring. Maybe even in your life, perhaps there should be more times for silent reflection and silent contemplation as you direct your thoughts to your Lord and King. Amidst the hustle and the bustle of this very noisy world, there are times And it's good to be silent before the Lord. But here, here in the public place of worship, here the emphasis is very much on exuberant praise to God. Uh, Let me draw your attention to a particular word here at the beginning of verse 1 or in the second line. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. Shout to God. I wonder if you ever noticed how, how often that word shout is used in the Psalms. Maybe it'd be good to go home and get a concordance if you have one in the house or look it up online. You'll, you'll find the word shout actually occurs quite a number of times. A shout of praise. Maybe it brings home to us that our praise shouldn't be a half-hearted mumble. Maybe sometimes it can be like that. As if it were a bit of a chore and not something that you're really wanting to engage in. Maybe when you reflect upon this, when you go home this afternoon, you might need to confess that sometimes your praise has been half-hearted, that you, you haven't really been eager to sing praise enthusiastically and with devotion to the Lord. Surely, dear brothers and sisters, Whenever we set ourselves to praise the one who is the king of all the earth, we should sing it, sing heartily in adoration to him, in celebration of all that he has done for us. Well, as well as a summons here to engage in exuberant praise, this opening call to praise, it's also joyful, isn't it? It's also joyful. Look at the second line again. Shout to God. With loud songs of joy. Now there's an issue of translation here. Uh, For example you had the New King James translation. Uh, It translates it with a voice of triumph. With the voice of triumph. 
And the Hebrew could be rendered that way. But really when you think about it, there's no real contradiction between with a voice of triumph and a loud song of joy. The two go hand in hand, don't they? I remember well many a triumphant cry of victory on the football field whenever, occasionally, my football team had won a game. It was a triumphant cry and it was a a joyful cry because we'd won the victory. Joy and victory or triumph go hand in hand. So this is a psalm calling us to a joyful celebration of the victories won by the king of all the earth. Now, let's note, of course, as you know, some of the psalms are mournful in their tone. And rightly so, because they express our, the, the sorrow we ought to have for sin. And therefore there's a definite place in the psalm book for what you might call more mournful tunes that we sing them to, such as St Kilda or St Dunstan. However, I think it's not going too far to say, it's not going too far to say the predominant note in the book of Psalms is a joyful one. It's a joyful one. So ensure, seek to ensure, dear friends, with the help of the Holy Spirit, when you come to sing praise, if there's joy in your heart, expressing the joy of your salvation, In the Lord Jesus Christ. Well that's the opening verse. The opening call to praise. Secondly. Praise the king of all the earth. Who has favoured his people. Verses 2 to 4. Look at verses 2 to 4. Praise the king over all the earth. Who has favoured his people. We're going to look in a little while at. How he has favoured his people. And also why he has favoured his people. But just before that, take note of the reverend attitude here. Verse 2. For the Lord is the covenant God, the most high, far higher than any other rulers, is to be, is to be feared. Is to be feared. And we shouldn't miss that word. We shouldn't miss it. For while our our praise can be rightly joyful and exuberant, we must never ever lose the reverence that ought to be there when we come to worship the great king. Imagine if you were called into the presence of an earthly king, King Charles III. Would you do that in a very casual manner? You'd hardly come before him In the way you would greet a shopkeeper or a tradesman or someone you just happened to meet on the road. If you were to come into the presence of the king in Buckingham Palace, you'd hardly do it with a hop, a skip and a jump, would you? I think the king would be quite shocked if you did that. You might end up in the Tower of London. Surely you'd come before the king in a manner which gives recognition to the majesty of and splendor of his office, wouldn't you? If you come before him with humility, with an attitude of respect, how much more so then should we not approach our great king, the great king of all the earth, with reverence and with awe? Sadly, often nowadays, worship services can be lacking in reverence. Maybe you remember some years ago even, this is an extreme example I know, and happily it's not, it's not uh, around at the mo- much at the moment, but some years ago there was a thing called, it was called the Toronto Blessing, because it supposedly started in Toronto in Canada. And as a result of the Toronto Blessing, the, which claimed that the Spirit of God was actively at work in worship, people were actually encouraged, you may find this hard to believe, but it's true, they were actually encouraged even to fall down in fits of laughter in the midst of worship services. This was supposed to be the Spirit of God acting upon them and they would roll about and fall around in fits of laughter. Now, rarely does it go become so extreme, but there are some worship services and they make you wonder whether those gathering there were in a nightclub rather than in a church building because the reverence, the sense of God's holiness that he is to be feared, it's missing, it's lacking. 
Dear brothers and sisters, let's seek to maintain a deep appreciation for the majesty and the glory of the one whom we're called to worship. May that always shape our praise and our worship services. So there's reverence in verse 2. But I want to notice especially now how the great king favours his people and why he has favoured his people. Verses 3 and 4. 3 and 4. First of all, he favoured his people by subduing nations under them. Israel singing praise to the Lord because, stanza 3, he subdued peoples under us. Now this probably refers to the way in which the Lord had enabled Israel to conquer the promised land. There were many peoples in the land of Canaan. And some of them were very formidable. Some of them even were called the Anakites and they were giant, gigantic. They were gigantic and at first, as you know, the people of Israel trembled. The spies and the people of Israel, most of them trembled when they saw them. But the Lord had enabled Israel to overcome all these nations and to conquer the promised land. Many formidable enemies had stood in the way. But the mighty king of all the earth had given his people Israel the victory over them and forced them into submission, even under our feet. It's a powerful expression. How might we apply this? Well, surely in a much more wonderful way. Surely you and I should want to praise this day the Lord who has gained the victory and given us the victory. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has triumphed over the principalities and the powers and who is able to deliver his people, therefore, from the dominion of darkness. The one who must rule until all his and our enemies are placed under his feet. As well as praising God, favouring them by subduing their enemies, Israel is, adore, is to adore the great king for the heritage, or we could translate the inheritance he had granted to them the inheritance he had granted to them now you might be a bit puzzled by the phrase the pride of jacob in verse four might be a bit puzzling it's best to understand this as referring to the land in which israel took supreme delight i'm sure in some sense there's a right way in which we can be proud of living here in northern ireland there are things we can take pride and be glad about we live in this land. There, is, there are, with all its faults and all its problems, there are reasons we can be glad. The north coast here, for example, what a beautiful, beautiful place. It's, it's acknowledged throughout the world as a place of great beauty, this Causeway Coast. So there's a sense in which we can take a certain pride or be delighted that we live here. Much more so the people of Israel, the land flowing with milk and honey. It was their pride and their joy, their delight. And they hadn't found this land for themselves, had they? No, they hadn't. They, they hadn't just stumbled across it in their travels. But it's acknowledged the great king of all the earth, to whom all the territory in the world ultimately belongs, that great king of all the earth had chosen it for them and he brought them into it and enabled them to conquer it. Given them an inheritance in it. An inheritance. Again, how might we apply this in New Testament terms? What inheritance has the Lord given to us? An inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. Already ours in principle and reserved in heaven for us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Surely here's another reason to want to sing praise to this great king who has given us such an inheritance. So that's uh, how he had favoured his people. But there's more. Why had he favoured his people? Why had he favoured Israel? Look at the closing words of verse 4. He chose our heritage, our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he, whom he loves, or some translations rendered in the past tense, whom he loved. But it's probably good to take it in the, in the present and the He loved and he still loves. Let that phrase get a hold upon you. Whom he loves. Israel had been given the victory, granted the inheritance because of the king's gracious love for them. Again, you can see the parallel, can't you? How much more so shouldn't you and I want to praise the Lord who has shown such love to us in Jesus Christ? 
that we are, as the Bible tells us, even more than conquerors through him who loved us. That we're on our way to heaven this day, not because we first loved him, but because he first loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And how much he has lavished his love upon us that we should be called the children of God, adopted as the sons and daughters of the living God. So yes, yes, Israel wanted to sing praise to the great king because he had favoured them and he, he loved them. So too should we. Let's move on to the third part of the psalm. Verses 5 to 7. I've given it this heading. Praise the king of all the earth who has ascended. Who has ascended. Before we look at the New Testament parallel here. You need to understand the, the ascension that's in view here in the history of Israel. What has this to do with? It says in verse 5. God has gone up. With a shout. What does that refer to? Well there's a close parallel between the phrasing here. That God has gone up with a shout. And the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Between these words. And the words of 2 Samuel chapter 6 verse 15. 2 Samuel chapter 6. For there we find these words. The terms shout and sound of a trumpet. And what's the context there in Samuel? Well the context is the Ark of the Covenant being brought up to Jerusalem, onto Mount Zion. For a long time, as you know, the ark would symbolise the presence of the Lord among his people. It had been languishing in an obscure location. But what celebration, what joy, what excitement, what their delight there was among the people of Israel when the ark of the covenant was brought up to Jerusalem. So the ascension in view here in the context is the Lord, as it were, symbolically ascending Mount Zion as a way of visibly assuring his people that he is in their midst and he is among them and he's reigning on their behalf. But surely there's something prophetic about this as well, isn't there? For centuries, actually, the Christian church has recognised this psalm speaks prophetically about the ascension of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Those churches that follow a, a liturgical cal calendar, I'm not recommending that, but they do, uh, when the day of ascension comes, this is a psalm that is often chosen. They recognise this is speaking ultimately about the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the story of Jesus doesn't end at the cross, so the cross is supremely important. Doesn't end at the empty tomb, though the empty tomb is vital. But the story of Jesus goes on to tell us, doesn't it, that he ascended up to the highest place. Hence, as you and I gather to praise the Lord, let's, let's be aware that we gather to adore the ascended Lord and King. The one who is now seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but in the age to come. And you see how the remainder of this section, verse 6 and 7, it's, it's actually just brimful with praise to this ascended Lord, isn't it? It's brimful, that's the best word I could think of, brimful with praise. Look again at verse 6, the four calls. Do you see it there again? Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. Then verse 7 once more, sing praises. The translation here says, with a psalm. With a psalm. There's a slight issue of translation here. Some versions render it, sing praise with understanding. With understanding. The Hebrew word is maskil, which is hard to translate. And the metrical version we're going to sing at the end of the service, therefore, the phrase is sing praises with care, or sing psalms with care, with understanding. It may well mean that in line with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15, I will sing with the mind also. I will sing with my mind. I will sing with understanding. In other words, we should sing joyfully. We should sing praises reverently, but we should also sing praises thoughtfully thinking about our great king who has ascended up on high three things so far we've looked at the psalm how the psalm is 
opened as an opening song, uh, uh, or as an opening call to all peoples to sing praise to the king of all the earth. It is set before us how this great king has favoured his people. It has directed our attention to the king who has ascended into glory. Now the final part of the psalm, verses 8 and 9. The heading I've given is, Praise the king of all the earth before whom the nations will assemble. Before whom the nations will gather. Look at verse 8. The princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to our God. He is highly exalted. And just note there as well, verse 8. God sits over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The note of holiness, again a reminder to us. The king whom we come to worship is the holy one, deserving of all reverence and honour. But what about this picture here? The, the king of all the earth whom all the nations will gather. It speaks about, it speaks about here... Uh, the princes of the people gather, but they're really representative of the nations. Where, where the princes gather, they're, 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 they're representing the, the, the people of their nations. They're, it's a great gathering of people here before the God of Abraham. What's the idea here? What's the idea here? Well, surely what the idea here is the people from all nations of the world being brought to submit to and to adore the true and living God, the God of Abraham. Remember how it was said to Abraham, that the psalm I think is echoing this, that in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And actually, dear brothers and sisters, and our involvement this day in worship and praise, engaging in the adoration of the great king, isn't this part of the fulfillment of this psalm? Are we part of the fulfillment? In Christ Jesus, haven't we become graciously the children of Abraham? And can't we therefore be called the people of the God of Abraham? God has gathered us, called us. So there are quite a few lessons in this 47th Psalm. I've highlighted some of them as we've gone, as we've gone along. Emphasizing joyful praise, reverent praise and thoughtful praise. But what's the main thing that should impress itself upon us? What's the main thing that should impress itself upon us? Well, surely it's this. That praise is of supreme importance. It should be of supreme importance to us. Maybe some of us think, well, I can't really sing very tunefully. <coughs> well, we should sing as tunefully as we can, as harmoniously as we can. But that shouldn't stop us even if we can't sing so tunefully. We should sing. We're called upon to sing. That's the way in which we honour the king of all the earth. We sing praises to his name. And let it not be confined even to the corporate singing of praise. That's what's mainly in view here. But let's look for opportunity to sing praise to him in our homes. Around the breakfast or the kitchen table. As we have our meals. Can't we sing praise to him? Instead of the, the covenanters. I was talking about the covenanters some weeks ago in Scotland. Instead of them and the others in Scotland. When there was great spiritual vitality in the land. That as the people were cutting peat, I don't know what you call it, moss here, maybe peat or turf in the moss. As they were cutting the peat and the turf, it could be heard very often that they were singing psalms and praise to God. As they went about their work even. Uh, in Galway some years ago, uh, we had for a time quite a number of Nigerians. And Nigerian people are very expressive. And uh, this one particular Nigerian lady told me one day that uh, she was on a bus and uh, everyone started staring at her. Maybe she thought at first it was because of the colour. But no, uh, uh, one person told her, you're singing. And she was singing praise to God. She was singing quietly, but she was singing praise to God. She couldn't stop herself singing. Maybe we're a bit reticent, a bit more reserved. It was good. But especially, dear brothers and sisters, as the psalm is Telling us when we come together as the people of God, let praise resound to the great King and Saviour of the whole earth. How will I draw this message to a close? How should it draw to a close? Well, sometimes repetition isn't a good thing. Sometimes we turn off when something's repeated too often. Preachers should be wary of being too repetitive. But sometimes 
repetition is very necessary in order to impress upon us the most vital truth that we need to learn. And so I think there's no better way to draw this message to a close than by addressing to you the repetitive calls of verse 6. Here's what the Lord wants us to do, for he's the king of all the earth. He wants us to be doing this. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises to the glory of his name. Well, let's sing this psalm now. Let's sing praise as the psalm exhorts us so powerfully to do. It's psalm number 47. Uh, We're singing all of the portion. And the tune is uh, Church Triumphant. Church Triumphant. Psalm number 47 stands as one to the end. We'll stand now to sing praise to the King of all the earth and remain standing for the closing blessing. Lord, so many reasons for us to want to sing praise to your name this day. Lord, help us to be a people of praise. Help us be a people who delight to sing your praises in the course of worship services, in our own homes, and even in other times and places too, whenever we're inspired by your love and your mercy and your goodness. Lord, help us to be dedicated and devoted to singing praise to your great and worthy name, For you're the king over the whole earth and you're the gracious saviour of anyone who believes in you wherever they may dwell. And now may the blessing of the Lord God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you all this day and forevermore. Amen.